was underage and he had like a baggie of pills. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's candy. And I was like, oh, I like candy. So he <laughs> let me take one. And then like when we got to the club, like, I just, people were acting a little weird. And then when it hit me, I was just like, oh shit, I'm melting. Like I, like I didn't ha- really know how to control my body, yeah, yeah. you know, cause I had never done that before. Welcome, welcome you and all to another episode of the Global Latin Factor Podcast where we talk about Latino everything. I'm just going to look at your tea. Uh, I already said the name. I don't even know which camera, but we're not going to do it. We've got a different setup at this time, so bear with me as I'm getting used to this. Today, we have an amazing guest. Uh, again, this is the Global Latin Factor Podcast. My name is Crispin Valentin. It's, this is another Exchanging Code episode. <laughs> If you have not checked out the other episodes that we have, I suggest we, you, go check it out right now. We have today, and she might not agree with the introduction, but I think she deserves every single thing that I'm about to mention. She's a, an international DJ, entrepreneur that specializes in e-commerce, content creator, creator financial professional. Uh, she's been DJing for over a decade, 14 years to be exact, or I don't know exactly the date, the birth date. She got here to the United States about a year and a half. She was about a year and a half years old, all the way from Vietnam. Did I get everything correct? Yeah. All right. Another exchange in culture episode, so I can let Carlos do that graphic. Beep, 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 beep. All right. How you doing today? Good. Um, this is a different uh, setup. I'm getting used to it because I'm accustomed to just sitting down and like, so that way people can tap in like the way the podcast is supposed to work. Okay. And they'll be all up in our business listening. So, all right. First, we're going to go ahead and start with a segment that I like to call Preguntas al Chile. If you have not subscribed to the Preguntas channel, I don't know what you're Chile. waiting for. Subscribe to the channel right now. So, you can check out the graphics. They're going to be updated on our third year. <laughs> I guarantee. I just got to do a couple of things. Are you ready? Yeah. Tacos or tortas? Tacos. Corn tortilla or flour tortilla? Corn, all the way. All righty. Gorditas or pupusas? Ooh, that's a hard one. I would say pupusas. Pupusas? Yeah. They go hard. Mexican coca or jarrito? Do you know what those are? Yeah, Mexican coca. Yeah. Okay. Agua de horchata, the flavor waters, horchata, jamaica, or tamarindo? Do you know any of those? I don't drink any of them, but I do know them. Yeah. Probably um, horchata out of all of them. Because I've. I've had that the most. Yeah. Salsa verde, hot sauce, or salsa roja? Red sauce. Green sauce or red sauce? It depends. It depends. Like, if I'm eating tacos, I'll eat green sauce. Mm. But, like, everything else, I'll, like, do red sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Fun fact about tea that you already know, and uh, she's very familiar with these dishes because her second language, if I'm not mistaken, was Spanish for a long time. Yeah, growing up. Mm-hmm. Growing up. Wow. Ah. Okay, I'm going to try to say uh, menudo or pozole. Pozole. Okay, I'm going to try to say these dishes, uh, Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese dishes. I don't know if I'm going to say it correctly, but if uh, hopefully you get it. Pho or uh, bun bo u. Bun bo way. Bun bo way. Oh, wait, wait, y'all. Yeah. Which one would you the prefer? Second <laughs> the second one. Really? Yeah, it's spicier. Okay, yeah, because everybody, like anybody that you would ask is like, oh my God, fuck, fuck this, fuck that. Yeah, it's basic. It's too basic. Really? Yeah, but I mean, it hits, but it hits. but more flavors, the boom boy. Ooh, yeah. boom boy. That's the right, right way to pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Chaka or kako too? I don't know what you're talking about, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, chaka or kako too? Kakoto? Is that what it is? I'm going to let you read it. Which one? Where? Like right below the pho. Right below pho. Chaka. Uh-huh. Those supposed to be dishes per Google and the internet. I don't know what the first one is, so uh-huh. I'm going to go with the second one. <laughs> what is the second one exactly? Wait, let me see it again. What is the second one exactly? Uh, so braised fish. Braised fish. Yeah. Okay. So it's that's like a 
like a homey dish, like comfort food. Is it like, how would you describe it like an American equivalent to or close to? Like braised meat. Braised meat? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. That's enough of those because I like them all Butchering. <laughs> and I even Google how to say uh, it. YouTube how to say it. And it just, yeah, it didn't work this time. Sorry. My apologies. Vietnamese culture. You're good. Don't sue me. <laughs> Valentina Tapatio or Cholula hot sauce? Uh, I like Tabasco. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Your favorite, I know you like spicy food, so your very, very favorite spicy dish that everybody should try, what would that be? Oh, man, that's hard because my palate changes all the time. Really? Like, like, I just had crawfish. So, like, if you ask me right now, I'd probably say, I don't know, crawfish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, let's make it easier. Top three spicy food. Because you do like spicy. Yeah. I remember, that's our IG post that you like spicy. Yeah. What would be the, your favorite? Two, three dishes, spicy, spicy dishes. That is your favorite to you? Uh, I can't narrow it down, but I can. I, don't know, I can. I can say like Asian food, Mexican food. As long as it's spicy. It's spicy, yeah. I like. It. Okay, yeah. Mexican. No dishes, just overall cuisine. Yeah, like I, I just. Oh, those are probably my top two favorites. Is That's is cool. Asian cuisine and Mexican cuisine? That's or, cool. Yeah, like I, I love them. All like right. I eat it at least once, twice a week. I don't know if you know what these pastries are, conchita breads, conchas. They're like little round ones, look like tortoise shells. There's the brown Yeah, ones. I'm, I'm not huge on sweets. You're not sweet yeah. at all? Mm-mm. I like boba, but that's that's it. Like, I, I love yeah. juice, yeah. but I'm not huge on sweets. Fruits? Fruits, that's like my dessert. Okay. Yeah, but, like if, not... you, but if you give me like cake and stuff, like I'll eat it, but it's not my first choice. That's pretty cool. So one of the a conspiracy theory that when you heard, you said it must... It has to be true. So I know you, I know the uh, lizard people and uh, what was the other one? The, uh, it wasn't a conspiracy. More so like something happened to you as far as like uh, sleep paralysis. But Oh, you're talking about like spirituality? No, not spirituality, but like a conspiracy theory that you heard one time that you can almost, when you heard it, you said it, it had to be true. So I know you believe in the lizard people part, but is there any other conspiracies that you think when you heard? I'm like, it has to be real. No way, that's not true. I don't know, like a, like the assassinations of some of the political figures and stuff like that or gained of power. Political power? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I like JFK, for example. Yeah, that was no way. That was accidental. That's what or, I'm saying. There's just way too many things. That's what I'm saying, on. yeah. Yeah. And then that's just the ones that we know of because, of course, it's the president mm-hmm. of the United States, mm-hmm. right? But the ones that are lower tier type of people that people don't really know about them mm-hmm. that are gone mm-hmm. mm, yeah yeah we're just kidding uh cia and all them <laughs> so what comes to mind when you feel when you first hear the word latino latina latinx what first pops into mind when you hear those terms anger issues <laughs> yeah yeah is that because of friends that you have was I, I i had a uh an, an ex the only mm, ex that that was latina that was latina that mm. i ever dated and she had like mad anger issues like why was I, she so mad? I don't know. I'll, I'll never date another Latina like, again really? because of her. Yeah. She ruined it for you? <laughs> yeah, man. Was it bad, bad? It was that bad. Like physically bad or mm-hmm. just screaming bad? Like all of the above. Obsessive bad, everything. All of the above, yeah. She's not an excuse for us Latinos, but mm-hmm. we have a lot of drama, traumas, uh, traumas that we deal with, that we haven't dealt with, that we had coming up. Mm-hmm. And it steers from generations prior to mm-hmm. not only her. Her grandparents probably went through some horrible things and mm-hmm. her parents didn't do any better and carry it on to her. So I hope she finds healing, but not an excuse, but we have a lot of stuff that we still carry for g- generations that we still need to address. Right. So I don't doubt that she was mad and upset and everything else, but Hollywood doesn't help when they portray Latinas like mm-hmm. that because not every woman, woman is like that. Mm-hmm. But when they do it like that and you run into somebody like that, it's really good to assume that all of them are like that. Right. But they're not. Right. I'm not saying give a Latina another shot, but I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's one off. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so, all right, let, tell me a little bit about, well, of course, I know about you. I know your mom journey from Vietnam mm-hmm. to, so if my understanding correctly, Vietnam, if you're in Vietnam and you migrate into Vietnam, you first have to make it out of Vietnam to be able to even be sponsored or be, or somebody can sponsor you to be able to make it to the United States. 
Is that somewhat how it happened to y'all, like somebody from Vietnam? I think what happened was um, we got sponsored by, I think, my aunt. Correct. Uh, and then we had to be refugees in, like, Malaysia or Thailand or something like that. I, for- I forgot what country. I-, I-, I was only, like... Thailand. Not- was it Thailand? Yes, ma'am. Did you talk to her about it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it-, it was one of those countries where I think we were refugees for, like, a week or so or... I don't know how long, and then we ended up in California. Yeah. Uh-huh. Actually, now that you said Malaysia, it might have been, but I think she said it was Thailand. Uh, y'all stayed there for a bit. Uh, unfortunately, your dad was making plans to meet y'all, but uh, if, y'all not, if I'm not mistaken, I think he might have passed away. Y'all not 100% sure, because mm-hmm. even the family doesn't know about him. Mm-hmm. So, very sorry for your loss. The, is, does she t- ever tell you how she made it out uh, of Vietnam to just to get out? Because I know... There's a weird journey that they have to go through, like very dangerous, kind of sort of like Mexicans have to cross over the border. Um, Yeah, like there was several like tries, like her and my dad had tried to escape because it's like communist, you, you know? You have to escape, right? Yeah, you had to escape and they got caught like both times. So they like would spend time in like Vietnam prison and stuff like that. And then um, that's actually how she met my dad was they both they both got caught and they went to jail together. Yeah. And then so they, you know, they ended up getting married and he tried again. And that's, you know, that's when he got lost. And then uh, we actually got sponsored. So we didn't have to go through all that hardship because she had me, you know, she's not going to try to like immigrate illegally, you know, and, you know, something happens to me or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I meant not just Mexicanos that crossed over the border, but other other immigrants Mm -hmm. from South America that crossed over. Not just us Mexicanos, somebody else. So don't get in. Don't get. Uh. Your panties in the bunch if you hear me. He's like, oh, we're not only Mexicans. I'm just saying, calm down. I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it's trippy to me. Um, when I realize what it takes from somebody from Vietnam out of communist to escape, having to, like, talk about, you know, in the middle of the night, be very quiet. Uh, there's people patrolling all the time mm-hmm. and you having to get out and make sure they don't catch you because they'll throw her in jail. Luckily, they only threw her in jail because I heard worse. Like sometimes they just shoot you on the spot. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so yeah. like that's that's why I guess I'm, you know, very grateful and everything that she sacrificed for. Absolutely. And it, it's just not her; it's the majority of the people back then too. You know. Yeah. So absolutely. we like as a as Asians too, we also have like generational trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so y'all make it to california mm-hmm. right um remind me again the area san diego so san diego sd in the actual hood yeah we're in the hood for some time uh no we were in a really nice area nice yeah we were in a really nice area kind of near the san diego zoo yeah um we stayed with like um my aunt and my uncles and my cousins and stuff like that and then uh my mom was a single mom so you know she she would go to school full time and and go to work full time, wow. like, like just and also trying to learn a new language and stuff like that, you know. So like, yeah. uh, she has a, also a brother who lived in the hood, so uh-huh. they would kind of alternate babysitting me. So that's kind of how I I learned Spanish was because his baby mama was Hispanic, mm. so she was she would babysit me, and so when I started school. I was speaking like half Vietnamese, half Spanish. They actually <laughs> threw me in ESL because I I didn't really good english if you don't know what esl is english as a second language i had to go to esl too did you yeah, yeah i had to go for a couple of years so how many years did you do esl for i think just a year yeah yeah then so you started getting english and yeah that was it. so no english whatsoever when you went to school or very minimal I, like minimal because i mean at home it's like they speak vietnamese or spanish, spanish. yeah if, I, if i'm with my uncle then his baby mom would speak spanish to me yeah. you know because she she didn't speak english either <laughs> yeah how would you say what just childhood was for you? Uh, what is well, some of the most memorable things that you remember growing up? I mean, uh, you grew up in a nice area uh, with a Mexican uh, or Hispanic lady that spoke Spanish, but then, of course, you also have Vietnamese. What are the some of the memories that bring happiness to you when you go back and trace back, like, how, how you grew up? Uh, I mean, I, I was a 90s kid, you know? Like, back mm-hmm. then, we we didn't we weren't like iPhone kids, you know, like we, like the internet was barely popping up. So like me and my cousins, we would just, you know, go hang out outside, yeah, play outside. Like, I don't know, 
walk around the neighborhood, go to the nearby park, like uh, Balboa Park, which is really massive, really famous in San Diego. Nice. It was like walking distance within the, our, our neighborhood. So we, we would, you know, go there over there as kids, really. Uh-huh. Yeah. Your mom talks great about you as far as you being a great kid. However, you and I have something very in common. Uh, apparently, even though now she's your best friend, I think you might have ran away a few times from the house. Did you run away? Did I? Yeah, no. Yeah. I think she said she mentioned it. Yeah, I got into something and you ran away. I actually ran away a few times. I don't from the I don't house. I don't remember running away. Yeah. Okay. Maybe she I don't know what she said there. Maybe she was like, but yeah, I think she said that. But maybe No, not. I did run away. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, scratch that. You were a good kid overall. But you you wanted to be a doctor or you wanted to I don't know where you picked it up from that you want to be a doctor. Do you remember where? Yeah, so I had always known since I was six that I wanted to be a doctor. Mm. Um and it wasn't like you know the the traditional Asian parent wanting you to be a doctor or like an engineer or right. like anything or like talk to me when you doctor i actually just wanted to be a doctor because did you pick it up from i don't remember i just remember as early as as six i think like someone gifted me that game operation mm, yeah and i thought it was so cool yeah um and i've always i've always kind of been like a biology nerd yeah and like i don't know just from there so you go actually attempt to be a doctor but something happens that just is not it's not for you anymore what happened so i actually yeah, i went to college like uh, you know i studied school um like in my head like oh i'm gonna be a doctor yeah and then um when i did college I, you know i did pre-med as well uh graduated with a biology degree and um the finance business actually fell in my lap <laughs> So was this all in California? Or was it already here in here Texas? Here in Texas, yeah. When did you arrive here in Texas? What I came it? here when I was like 13, 12, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And was it here in the Dallas area or what area? Mansfield. So you were in Mansfield. Yeah. So you went to school over there? In Mansfield. Uh-huh. And for college, you also went here around the area? UTA. UTA? Yeah. Okay. TCC and UTA. Uh-huh. So you go to college, you find financial education, lands in your lap, and you start work, focusing on that? Are you partying at the time already or not necessarily? Right. Yeah. So I, when I first started college, I was really sheltered growing up because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in Asian traditional household, if you're like the only girl, they're going to be like super strict. My mom was really strict when I was growing up. And then, uh, so I didn't, I didn't ever like really go out and party or anything. So when I entered college, I started making more friends and I didn't even, it's funny because I didn't even hang out with Asians back then. I like was super whitewash in high school. This is like Mansfield. Mansfield. Yeah, yeah. In Mansfield, you know. So when I went to UTA or TCC, it was like I saw a lot more Asian people. And so it was it was kind of cool to like um culturally connect. Yeah. And then, you know, Asians we party. <laughs> when you say you party, like how hard do y'all party and do y'all really drink a lot of, a lot or just in general just Okay, so <laughs> my first time ever going out to a club um i was underage i was underage and my it was like my older friends Mm -hmm. so i like was just joking around and i was like hey you're gonna buy me drinks right and he's like yeah i'll get you water and orange juice and at the time i didn't get that reference because i was like what are you talking about you know and the club that we were going to wasn't a like a traditional club it was lizard lounge we were going to a rave rave. (laughs) so I, you know, I was such a, like a newbie to the party scene. I didn't know, you know, rave culture or anything like drugs or anything like that. And then he had like a baggie of pills and I was like, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's candy. And I was like, oh, I like candy. Are you serious? Yeah. (laughs) So he let me take one. And then like when we got to the club, I just like, that was the first time I ever like took ecstasy. (laughs) So when I say we party, we party. That kind of party. Yeah. So, like, that was my first time ever, like, in a club, so. What do you remember about that time for the first time you tried some, you know, it, it, it was literally out of, like, innocence a little bit of mm-hmm. ignorance because you were sheltered. Very naive back then. Very naive. Yeah, very naive. But they yeah. give it to you. When did they click on you that it's not candy? Um, I mean, when you, I don't know if you've ever been to Lizard Lounge. I mean, yeah. it's closed now. Years ago, yeah. Yes. It's closed now, but. Two floors, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we went. We went for this DJ name. His name is Darude Sandstorm. Yeah. Oh, that's him? Yeah. The Sandstorm song guy? Yeah. Yeah. So uh was this was it Sandstorm? I don't know. 
it was, I think it was Darude. Yeah. But he, he, I don't know, just the whole environment was was different. And then people were acting a little weird. And then when it hit me, I was just like, oh shit, I'm melting. Like I like I didn't ha- really know how to control my body. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I had never done that before. I heard I never done or indulged, but I heard your your senses simplify a lot whenever yeah, you're like, in it. Yeah, like like a like a like hundred times. times. And and like I like like uh and back then it's like uh we call it pokeballs. So they're like the real OG like t- ecstasy tabs. Mm. But mine was like a triple stack, so it's like three pills in one. So it was like extremely strong for your first time too. And I didn't know, yeah. So I didn't I didn't know there's like stages of when you're on the drug. So like you there's know a when it, yeah, there's a come down. So when it peaks, it like really it's like a roller coaster, right? So when it goes up, you're like really peaking, like really like it hits you hard. And that's where I was like melting and I was like I can't move my legs basically. And then so it, it's like a roller coaster so it kind of go went away. So the it wasn't hitting as hard. So my mistake was I told my friend, I was like, I think it's going away. And he's like, it's going away. So he gives me another one. Serious? Yeah. So <laughs> that, that was, that, that sucked. <laughs> Cause the come down like really, really sucked. You can't expect to drive around all day. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. First of all, uh, we, could, we don't, uh, say no to drugs. Yeah. <laughs> That's just what happened. That's just At what that happened. Yeah. Her experience. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, no alcohol whatsoever, but y'all party until every at two o'clock, right? Because here in Texas or the no, we like that night they took me to an after party too, so I didn't get home till like eight a.m. What did you? So and mom, when I when I came home, my dad was like looking at because he was like outside watering the yard, and he was like, "Are you drunk? Like, why are you home so late or something like that?" And I was like, still rolling. <laughs> so you you went you were actually still staying with your parents. And At you the time home? in college, uh huh. Wow. And then you, what did your mom say? Um, she was pissed. She's pissed because, like I, like I said, like I was in a really sheltered household, and I wasn't like before then. Like I wasn't allowed to be out past like ten p.m. So how old were you at that time? Eighteen, nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So you find out you want to do the study in doctor but then you find financial education but all those people around there were doing some similar things partying and the financial industry or not yet no so um that came later actually so i that was, that was my first time actually just going out nice and then i i developed like a like a like a crew you know i start i start partying more and more every weekend and um it got to the point where like my mom she couldn't really say anything to me because i was just going out so much now yeah and um I, you know, I, I was building up my DJing career as well and, okay. and my nightlife like career and stuff like that. Cause I was also, st- I started to promote as well. So in 2010, mm-hmm. the, are you already fully into the, the actual promotion crew yet or not I want to say by the, the following year, the year after that. Okay. It's kind of so long ago. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's been a minute. So 2010 technically is when you begin actually DJing, DJing, right? So mm-hmm. the story goes, one of the promoters notices that you are, and your whole crew roll deep, 15, 20 deep into mm-hmm. the club. Mm-hmm. So of course they like that because, you know. It's they, people. They, it's people. Yeah. They want to have the club. And uh, But previously, before you already been hanging around with the DJs, was mm-hmm. there anything that while you were in the DJ booth, ch- chilling with the DJs, that kind of sparked curiosity about DJing at all whatsoever at the time? Because... The promoter asked you, how can I get you to work with me? Mm-hmm. And you say, I want to be a DJ because he offered co- cocktail waitresses or whatever. But you declined and you say, I want a DJ. Mm-hmm. Was there anything prior to before you even accepted or saying, I want to be a DJ that you signed the DJ booth that might inspire you to want to pursue DJing? Um, I mean, I've always loved music. You know, music has, has just been the best kind of therapy for me. Yeah. And every time like I would just hang out in the DJ booth, I would actually watch like my friends like dj and i just thought it was so interesting and i would you know um like kind of want to like de- like they would ask me like oh do you want to try and i'll be like oh like but obviously they would be right behind me make sure it doesn't like you know mess up or yeah, anything yeah, like yeah. that you know so after i got it like a, a little taste of that i was like oh i really want to like try more you know but i didn't have any of like my own equipment the only time that i would actually you know quote unquote practice was when i was there in the clubs 
with my yeah. friends and they would let me like play a song with the assistants okay. like being right behind me so at that time is your ear already trained as to what you're hearing for as far as the transitions how you're going to be transitioning mm -hmm. at the time it doesn't even make sense at nope. the moment 2010 he gives you the promoter says fine you're going to do it wednesday you start your djing mm -hmm. you don't have no equipment nope your friends let you borrow their equipment dj friends what is it like to first of all when he says okay let's do it wednesday i like are you really like let's do it or you're like hesitant and we're like well i need to practice a little bit because i don't really know probably how to both but it was it was kind of one of those opportunities where it's like well i can't really pussy out now you know <laughs> yeah so you jump in it all right put me that day how is it how does your day work you get there about what time probably eight nine o'clock no Earlier? later 10 you get there by 10 10 yeah and everything's set up for you you have mm -hmm. to set up everything up no okay. I, I was you were you're a diva i was a diva yeah <laughs> so you get there you're somebody i'm guessing is playing something already yeah prior to your friends mm -hmm. so you start getting into it and once you're there are they pretty much coaching you through what to do i i mean yeah it's 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 basically like he lined up the song and he's like just play this next song and i was like Okay, but I wasn't familiar with his music. As a DJ, you need to be familiar with the, you know, the music so you know when the transition is and all that stuff. Right. And I was just like, I don't know this song. So I just tried to like transition into it and it was just like not happening. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today and checking out this amazing episode. Make sure you go and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment and a like. And now back to the episode. Okay, so whenever DJs do that, they call it train wrecking because you're just mm -hmm. not matching the beat. Uh, nothing, yeah, nothing yeah. is going right. Yeah. So he's just pretty much giving you a playlist and you're just playing the songs yep. at that time. Mm -hmm. How was the crowd? Was there anybody that was like, what the heck is going on? Yeah, probably. Because a lot of the people were your people because mm -hmm. pretty much what, 15, 20 people were your or more? No, there was like 200 homies. people. It was 200 people. Yeah, in a burger joint. In a burger joint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how are you feeling when you're feeling miserably? Like um, this is it for me. I mean, it, it was it was just it was, it was whatever. Like it just everyone was there to support me. They were all my friends, yeah. you know. And um, I trained wreck, but I mean, ha like honestly, half of the room was like so drunk. I don't think they even noticed. That's good. That's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Okay, for another person, for example, if you go through that experience and you fail miserably, you suck so bad. Mm -hmm. You know you did mm -hmm. that. It'll meet maybe discourage you not to do it again but what want to what make you want to keep going knowing that i i i had so much fun that night yeah? yeah from what i remember it was so long ago but from what i remember like i still had a blast yeah so but then other people start reaching out because there were, i know you've seen in the industry there was no asian female djs mm -hmm. there's lesbian mm -hmm. uh at, at all whatsoever mm -hmm. so were you the very first one in the I, entire DFW? I, would, I would say so in the entire dfw i would say so, so? yeah yeah that's yeah. awesome. And that was one of your goals, right? Whenever mm -hmm. you started to be that representation for... It's very niche, yeah. Yeah, very, very niche. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, even though it was fun, is that really what kept you going to try to keep doing it? Or was it the fact that you I were... mean, I was just happy partying and getting paid to party at this point. And now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a quote-unquote DJ. And even though, like, I was, you know, a baby at it. Um, but it's just... The more and more I did it, the better and better I got too, you know. Yeah. And then, and then the more recognition I started to getting getting from it too. Was it the money somewhat reasonable? For no, what hell you no. Were doing? It was like a hundred dollars a night, bro. It was <laughs> it wasn't the money. <laughs> what about your guest list at all? Any any money on that e either? Uh, you know, usually promoters work out a guest list and per per. To me, I think at the time it wasn't even about the money. It was just having fun. Yeah, having fun and being in the environment. There's something about being the DJ booth that makes you feel more cool than everybody else that can't get in the DJ booth. You're just chilling and just. I mean, that was everybody. part of the, another reason because I didn't want to be out in the crowd with the peasants. <laughs> True <laughs> that. So whenever I first started uh, MCing or even um, doing mic mm -hmm. or radio, internet radio, mm -hmm. I fell in love with the mic, knowing that somebody, if I played a song, somebody was like in tune and like oh that's my jam and i don't know it felt really good for me mm -hmm. so whenever you were djing i know you mentioned before the crowd the controlling of the crowd how you can make them feel is that part of the things that kept you besides the fun besides enjoying having a great time was that part of the things that kept pushing you to keep doing it yeah um like the better that i got especially the music back then it mm -hmm. was actually music that i actually enjoyed listening to um i would say like rap music now is, is not as good <laughs> even like 
EDM and pop music, but back in the early like 200 like 2000 it, it was it was fire man yeah. so it was just like i got to play the music that i wanted to listen to everyone loved it too and you know like we had like venues where it was like two thousand people two three thousand people packed out and they're all just grooving to the music that's what's up yeah okay so tell me about your name so at the very first gig do you even did they put you in the flyer do you have an official name is there a particular name that you're going by at that time yeah so i um i had always gone by like t-rex like that's just what everybody knows me as and back then because i was the baby of the group whenever i joined this promotion group uh -huh. it was mostly all guys in there i was the only only girl especially only female dj yeah so and these are all the guys that i would use their equipment or their music and they would like help me and during my gigs so i was the baby of the group so uh it was you know my they dubbed me dj baby rex DJ Baby Rex. Uh -huh. And that went in for how many years that you were not only the name, but using the your homie's equipment before you started getting and investing on your own equipment? Um, I can't exactly remember. I want to say maybe like for six years. Wow. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you like when I actually got my own equipment. Uh -huh. I, I think it was like a couple years after that because yeah. I was just kind of writing the coattails of everyone it sounds very like awful to say but it's the truth i uh, mean no because it puts you in a vulnerable position right that you wanted to you know you it's great that you had a great support system with the homies yeah but it's crazy that you even at the gig you were technically still practicing mm -hmm. but getting better at it yeah because yeah. it's i'm practicing in front fronts of like hundreds thousands of people you know yeah what but is, but it was so cool because it was just like the community of people that i all knew so to me i didn't feel weird about it or anything like that it's just like back then we used to club like five times a week Jeez. so you would see the same people every night you know five so, times a week. so it's like i i pretty much it's like a huge party with all your friends so i didn't feel embarrassed or anything like, even if i did mess up you know like nobody said anything yeah okay so six years is it for you whenever you buy your very first like controller mm -hmm. is it like whenever you're by your like whenever you're a kid and get your favorite present and you kind of tuck it in with your be in bed with you and kind of like baby it and love it uh was it something like that for you your very first equipment your very first controller or nothing like that um no i don't i don't remember it like that really? I, I just I, I remember like when i had bought my equipment i bought it off craigslist actually really and it was like at the time it was like a newer control it was like the controller of that year oh. so for me to find it for that price and it had a custom skin on it, it was like unbelievable. Like, so it was funny because like when I rolled up to the guy to pick it up, he thought I was a dude. So he kept saying like, yeah, bro, like I'll be all man. <laughs> and then when he, whenever he like comes out and he sees that it was me, yes, he was, sis. he was like, he was like, oh, yes, uh, here you go. Yeah. So it was, it was, that was kind of funny. That's crazy. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So when does uh, the evolution of you doing away with the baby and becoming T-Rex? Because I've seen it spelled T and then Rex, two X's. Mm -hmm. And then I see it spelled T-H-I and then Rex. Which was the way that you're doing it now? Or it's always been, oh, it's just, it is T-Rex. It's just the way that you're doing on social media is different. Um, I think, I think it was like more like a, like the name wasn't available issue. Mm. Like, so I rebranded myself and I was uh kind of going through like different marketing techniques and stuff like that. and. So it went from Baby Rex to T-Rex with, without the H. Mm. So it was just like T-R-E-X-X. -X. And then um, when I tried to, I think when, like, when I tried to find it on like Instagram or something like that, yeah. like it wasn't available. And so like that's why it's kind of spelled a little different on my Instagram right now. Yeah. And then also my TikTok. Okay. Yeah. So you spell it with T-H-I. T-H-I because the T T r e x x wasn't available or something like that yeah why did they call you t-rex why was it the rex where did the name and the nickname come from uh so that dates back to like when myspace was around <laughs> yeah. and uh i needed a username it was either that or t thizzle but why i love jurassic park So that's why. Yeah, Jurassic Park is one of my favorite. I was going to say, you don't have little arms. No. You don't have like <laughs> no. small arms to be able to. So you like T-Rexes and mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. I always, back in the day, I used to post all those memes about the T-Rexes with them little 
with the Artificial. arms. Yeah. <laughs> I have a bunch of them still. Yeah. I'm going to send them to you because there's a bunch of them. Okay, so you continue maneuvering. You're learning now. You're in the game for about six years. You got your own equipment. And when does the international DJing comes to be? You're still with that crew for some time. And I don't know if they lead you to become international and start traveling around the world. Or how does that come about? Um, At this point, it was like 2000. 16 mm -hmm. 2017 and by this time like i had already dj'd all over dallas i've done festivals um you know big corporate events and stuff like that so like the next thing on my bucket was like djing overseas because at that yeah. point like i had i started traveling a lot and i was like oh it'd be really cool to to dj overseas you know and um just because like at that time i was getting bigger in in the you know dj scene and the you know the nightlife industry nice i i was already traveling overseas so i was talking to you know my my business partner at the time mm -hmm. and i was just like how could i like dj overseas like who do you know anyone that i could like reach out to and yeah. it, to me it's like all about connections you know so he actually knew someone over overseas and then like that kind of just like was like the blueprint of everything because i was i was visiting like five different cities so mm -hmm. i just made it up because i i knew some people out in asia so i made it a point just to reach out like it's who you know you know yeah so you let them know you're a dj you're looking forward to seeing that and are, are all these trips and everything else getting funded by the dj no. at that time uh so because i was already going there how i kind of pitched myself overseas was like hey you know i i already have airfare and hotel and that's like the biggest cost, mm -hmm. you know? So I was like, you just need to pay me for my set. So it was just like extra spending money over there, which is nice. Yeah. What's up. Is that with the financial education or was it separate that you were doing it or you were visiting family? No, I was just on vacation. And what area were you at at that time in Asia? Um, uh, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Tokyo, uh, Thailand, Singapore. All those places you were DJing, you uh -huh. DJ at. Uh -huh. And where else? In Anywhere in Europe? Not also? Europe yet. No. Not yet? But it, a Asia. Yeah, yeah, Asia. So how, how, what is the biggest crowd that the DJ that you have DJ for here in the Dallas area or DFW or even in the States and the biggest crowd over there in Asia? Um, what? Biggest crowd here is like, I, I mean, I've done festivals, so it's like thousands of people. And like even like uh, just like our... Asian parties that we used to throw back then, mm -hmm. like special events, it would be like thousands of people. Wow. Like we would pack out, um, the biggest venue that we had was um, at the Wyndham. I don't know if you're familiar with that yeah. hotel. The Wyndham, yeah. they have a, yeah. they used to have a club in part of that hotel. Really? And it could pack out like three to 4,000 people in that club area and we would pack it out. Yeah, we'll pack it out. Mm -hmm. Dang. What about Asia? What was the biggest cr crowd you ever did? Uh, I mean, I just did regular clubs over yeah. there. So it wasn't like, massive you know um but yeah it was just like regular club was it like a big different sensation for you to be dj over there as far it as was here? to me it was little um uh, adjustment because their music is a little behind mm -hmm. uh, i remember when i sent in my like mix or something like that to one of the promoters and he had mentioned that they're a little bit behind on music and I think the music that I sent was like two years old, and he was like, "Oh, this is still like like underground music." Are you serious? And I was like, "Are you, are you for real?" And he's like, "Yeah, like we're really late on our music." So I had to play like five, ten years old music. Are you kidding? Yeah, because like the some of the stuff that I was playing, even though it was old to us, like it would, like they had they haven't heard it. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay, let's go back and touch up on a part that I I, I think is important for people, especially maybe in the community in your community. Mm -hmm. Um the Vietnamese community of somebody this. So you were the first lesbian DJ mm -hmm. female here. Mm -hmm. Okay. For me, like Mexicano, uh, things that I've seen on TV whenever I think of somebody that's Asian or from the Asian community, from very uh, traditional, very um, kind of sort of like conservative. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if lesbian can fit into that as that community or that thing. Is, is that something that you had to deal with? Did you have any kind of, you know, backlash or name calling or whatever the case might be? Within, when I became a DJ? When I became a DJ, when you came out, they knew that you were lesbian. Yeah, so I, you know, I've always kind of, like, 
march to the beat of my own drum right. um I, I i believe like being authentic to yourself is is really important right um i can't stand being fake you know right um so i've always just been really true to myself and to me that was like the hook for everyone because not only was i a, a like a asian female dj but i was also a lesbian as well wow. so it was like i didn't get any backlash from that and Sometimes I feel like it's almost like a double standard because mm. I feel like if it was somebody else, they might have, you know, so I don't know. So no problem booking whatsoever. You mm. actually made them want to book even more right. because you, for whatever reason, right. that was something attractive mm -hmm. to them. Okay. What about at home and your mom and everybody else? Is this anything like that that they're fond upon because you're this, because you're that? Uh, thankfully, like my parents are very understanding and, yeah. and um, welcoming. Um, I actually didn't want to come out to my parents because I thought that like my parents would disown me. My mom actually made me come out. <laughs> she kind of already knew, right? She like, okay, so like I had like my first girlfriend mm -hmm. and me and my first girlfriend broke up. So I was like super heartbroken. And um, I was like really like on the DL, like, oh, I don't want anyone to know. I don't especially I don't want my parents to know like right. anything, anything like that. Right. But my mom, like, I mean, mother's intuition, though. Mm -hmm. So she was just like, you know. It's like it's okay like it's a phase and i was like uh <laughs> no i was like i don't know still gay mom <laughs> <laughs> until this day still gay mom <laughs> okay so i heard something about on a in the same subject i heard mm -hmm. something on a on a interview that you talked about that you know dating for you is very interesting nowadays mm -hmm. you date very seriously with intentions mm -hmm. you don't try to waste nobody's time mm -hmm. and you want a family mm -hmm. how is that for you when you talk about that you're talking about as you having a, a baby or adoption or the person your partner having a baby yeah so i that's just ignorance of my part and no curiosity. it's okay yeah sure it's um i i really want kids in a really unconventional way i guess yeah um i myself i don't want to carry i do want my own biological kids though because mm. just because i just like a. I do self, I suffer from like body dysmorphia. Like I actually thought I was going to be transgender growing up. So really? yeah. So it w it was like a, something that I had to deal growing up with and then figuring out like, just n like in general, navigating my sexual, my sexuality growing up was yeah. really confusing and really like mentally draining. And then, um, to accept myself as like just being, being queer, you know, because like I, grew up in a really religious baptist household yeah so i you know i didn't want to be condemned to hell you know i didn't want and then you know of course everyone wants to be, fit into society as well you know like if 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 i could be straight and be normal and in, in the normal standard of societal perception you know like why would you want to go against the grain you know but yeah. it's just it's just who i am so i myself like even though i, I still struggle with like body dysmorphia and, and stuff like that so i i don't think i can mentally handle bearing children myself mm -hmm. so i would actually would want my partner to carry my 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 eggs no surrogate just your partner my will partner be? Mm. yeah okay my partner all right just i was just curious mm -hmm. about that part yeah you know I, first of all i'm sorry to hear about that i don't know how troublesome it was mm -hmm. how severe it got to you that you have to deal had to deal with that and still dealing to this day mm -hmm. so um, you know I'm, i hope that you know you find healing and you're you're a very pretty girl oh, just like your you. mom's you're you're a beautiful girl you're a beautiful human being as far as what i'm able to see you do come off as very don't want to talk to nobody in the beginning when you first meet you mm -hmm. but once you warm up you're super nice awesome yeah, amazing I, I, I like to observe people yeah. um i don't know I, just, I guess i've just always kind of been like that <laughs> hey to each your own yeah. sometimes uh yeah not not everybody's like um freaking social butterfly all the time immediately mm -hmm. you know what i mean i'm mm -hmm. the same way sometimes mm -hmm. i just feel like i just more recently i've been more of like jokey jokey mm -hmm. to everybody but mm -hmm. then some people are not welcoming to the jokey jokey part right. so you just gotta be like okay, right yeah hi, how you doing yeah Bye. but yeah no you're you're very very cool um overall Thank in general you. i think Appreciate you have that. a very interesting life um and then again just the physical part in general you look you look great so doing the transition of the dj and kind of sort of within that you become somewhat of a restaurant owner with mm -hmm. the management ag agreement or management understanding as well right? right yeah so uh the same guy that i was working with in the 
club industry. Yeah. Um, you know, we wanted to just be bigger. Like I, I've always had big dreams. Right. You know, and that's something that's really important to me. And that's to me, like it's also when it comes to dating, it's like I can't be with someone who doesn't dream as big as me. Yeah. You know, I need them to meet me there. So I always have like ideas or like how much, how I can improve myself or like you know what what can I you know I don't know just more I just want more absolutely um and so yeah we got into the restaurant business and um I you know we were lucky that we didn't have to put down like any money and stuff like that but mm -hmm. we were still able to be like partners in it that's great um so we had the first um Asian fusion restaurant in Las Colinas that sold lobster pho what? yeah so we lobster had the most pho. expensive pho in DFW but people from you know all over the metroplex still came out and, and ate our pho um it was a time that it was a little bit too unique for that time i think if we would have done it now it would have been more successful uh -huh. but back then it was just like it was like just the concept of it was just like too kind of far out there and then just like owning a business like a brick and mortar is very difficult too so a lot of overhead mm -hmm. a lot of stuff you have our, our restaurant was huge it. so wow. yeah and then and Anna was in Las Colinas what was the price point at the time for the uh, pho, the lobster pho was it way too crazy price or yeah, 35 still, yeah 35 dollars not bad if you have a lobster it was, I mean you had a whole pound lobster Jeez. yeah where did the idea come to do that like who who came up with that I, I mean I to be honest, I I can't say that I may, I came up with the idea. I think I just saw it on like Facebook one day. Like somebody else had it in Vegas, but they were charging like seventy five dollars. You like that. wanted to implement that, and that's yeah, that too. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so I, I kind of not stole the idea, but I was like, I was like, we don't have anything cool like that in Texas, you know. So when that opportunity kind of fell in my lap, I was like, hey, how come we don't? Do, we should do something like this. It's kind of different, you know. See, I don't understand sometimes because you're. There, somebody else is doing it somewhere else, and you there's a lack here. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to do the same thing? Right. It's not like it's a rights of you the only like, one. Yeah, I didn't like steal his recipe yeah. or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, you know? exactly. it, was, it was our own recipe, but your own recipe. But the concept was the same. Yes, you know, it's just like everything else. Though. Like DJing, it's all the same. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. DJing, artists, everything else. We get inspiration from a painting or whatever, and all of a sudden you just begin doing mm -hmm. your thing. So mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. your own way, your own creation. Right. Without intentions to you to stealing their idea, but right. you making your own thing. You know? Absolutely. So, uh huh. Is my collar up? Am I good? Yeah. Am I good? Oh, you gotta. God damn. Carlos never tells me about my <laughs> collar. Don Carlos. All right. So at that time, you did financial education for some time, but you also dive into e commerce. How does that How does that work out? How do you find about e commerce? And there's a particular particular thing that you do private labeling, or what is right. it called? Uh, yeah. So. I like to work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. I have a particular lifestyle that I want to attain. Uh, I'm not much of like a corporate person, like straight up nine to five. If you tell me that I had to be in office all day, I'd probably tell you to like go screw yourself. Did you try it? I mean, that's what that's what I kind of had to do with the final financial education at the beginning. And it wasn't for you. And it wasn't for you. It wasn't for me. So I, I kind of put that on the back burner mm -hmm. and did my, own, my my other projects, you know. Yeah. And um e commerce, I mean, just researching a lot, it's just like it's if you're using platforms like Amazon, Spotify, or yeah. not Spotify, Shopify, Shopify, Shopify mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's okay. it's it's like they kind of do everything for you. So that's what drew me into e commerce. Who introduced you to that? Where did you see it? Did you see a video? Did somebody tell you yeah, about it? Yeah, just online. Yeah. Yeah. Online you started looking at how Shopify and Amazon works, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden you started implementing your own stuff. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, they like you said, they do everything for you, but you just have to be the one that promotes everything, right? Right. So according to your lifestyle, you kind of accustom some of maybe the items that you have that you, you know, represent on your post, and then you know put it out to people to buy it. Is that kind of how it works? Uh, no, really? I actually don't even promote the stuff that I sell. Really, which is kind of fun. I should, but um, it's it's like it's more so like the idea of making money while I slept. Okay really intrigued me especially like with the amazon platform it's like they deal with the customer service they deal with the shipping i actually just have to buy the inventory i ship it to their warehouse and i slap my brand logo on my stuff and it's it's my my brand you know is there a licensing that you need for that particular or not nothing okay and then okay so i do print on demand mm -hmm. with amazon mm -hmm. 
So all the Global Land Factor podcast shirts, they're going to be posting here all over the place very soon all mm -hmm. the time because I haven't, I slacked. They uh, do everything for me too, mm -hmm. except for all I did is upload the, the graphics mm -hmm. and they do everything. So else. similar. Something, the same thing. So yeah, similar. So with me, it's just uh, my own personal brand. Like so It's like if I sold coffee mugs, it would just have my logo on it and that's my own brand. Really? Mm -hmm. That's cool. And what is it called on uh, Shopify and Amazon? It's different brands. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't even tell you. I have I have a couple. <laughs> and you sell everything, right? You yeah, sell it's, from... it's like random stuff like baby blankets, like uh, electronics to like home stuff. Like It's just random stuff that makes sense data wise. And to get started on that, let's say, for example, platform like Amazon, mm -hmm. do you have to like, for example, for print on demand, I have to apply, you have to approve me. And once I'm approved, then I can go ahead and begin. Is that similar to the same thing with e-commerce? Uh, yes. Like the thing with e-commerce is you have it's with especially private label. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to have a lot of liquidation up front. Okay. Yeah. So you do it's, have to have some capital in the yeah, beginning. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of capital in the beginning. Yeah. And I and it's not a little bit of capital. I want I want to say like five to ten thousand dollars. So five to ten thousand dollars to get you going. Mm -hmm. So at that time you saw everything, you took a risk, you had that capital and you put it into use to be able to create your own. My own and it brand, was yeah. and how when did you start it it started making sense for you? Because I'm pretty sure it's still new for you. I know you joined a bunch of groups, uh, Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. Is that somewhat of what helped you to keep ramping up your brand and right selling? yeah so it's, it's just to me like i always feel like it's really important to invest in yourself mm -hmm. and if you have a business obviously you need, you need to invest in your business you know right. so i i even hired like a like a like a coach like a met like you know fba um like mentor fba uh what's that for it's fba yeah. is uh where where you buy something mm -hmm. and then they do everything for you. FBM is, uh, let's say like they, they buy something off your listing. You're the one that has to ship it in. Uh, yeah. So FBM, FBA, you don't have to worry about no, that. You just ship yourself into the warehouse mm -hmm. and then they handle everything. And I'm, I'm assuming because they do everything, they took a little bit of a higher cut right. than if yeah. you were to Yeah, do there's, there's fees. There's like yeah. storage fees. There's like, uh, like fees for that too. That's cool. Mm-hmm. So how, how lucrative is this for you to be able to do it like this? Does it keep you afloat? Does it keep you with the lifestyle that you like? Because if you see your Instagram, you're always looking nice, suits, hat, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you look, look great. It looks great. Uh, is that kind of sort of because of the lifestyle that you have created with this business? for? How long have you done it for? Uh, Only like a year. Only like a year? Mm -hmm. Wow. But this is what you do pretty much full time for the most part. Uh, I would... I mean, yeah, it, it's it sustains my lifestyle, and then also I still DJ it's on the side, people. and then now I'm back into financial, um, financial industry. So that's that's been taking up a lot of my time, but it's I feel like it's more fulfilling. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right now in the DJing, so you're gonna continue to grow that e-commerce. Uh, it's something. I'm kind of, it's kind of like on autopilot right now. Okay. Uh, I'm not really putting too much work into it, like. Honestly, like you just have to set it up and make sure that like your marketing is good and advertising and then making sure that you have inventory at this point. Advertise it in Amazon. In Amazon. You, they have so, their own av advertisement. Yeah. So you do it through there mm -hmm. and they do it all that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you just have to make sure there's a spreadsheet that you have to kind of monitor inventory, make sure that you're not mm -hmm. lacking or you start to sell it even more. Right. Then when do you dictate when you want to introduce a new product? Do you kind of study the market a little bit and see and then go yeah, for it? Yeah, like. Like right, like I'll give you an example. Like one of my products right now, I'm just trying to liquidate it at at this point because it's not selling as great. But I still got to make my money back, so mm -hmm. you know maybe I'll drop the price or whatever like that, right? Just to make sure that it runs out of inventory, and then from there I'll just kind of look for another product to replace that. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. So is that that's the passive thing that you it's do? Passive income where uh -huh. you set it up once, mm -hmm. making sure everything's good, mm -hmm. and uh, within the promotion, everything, and making sure that. It still right. works for you. Yeah. And you just got to monitor it so often and get them checks in. Yeah. Okay. And then the DJing, uh, where are you DJing at the moment at this time? Right now, um, I have a Saturday residency at Common Table over in McKinney. McKinney. And then I actually have a meeting in the, after this. Um, maybe I have a, another venue out on Fridays in Dallas. Okay. Best of luck. You need a booker, which is great. <laughs> I've been to uh, Common Table. Uh -huh. Pretty chill. Chill, chill place. yeah. 
very chill place yeah. if you want to relax, uh, enjoy some tunes, have drinks. They have very unique tune, uh, cocktails and stuff like that that I've seen. Mm-hmm. And their food is pretty it's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm vegan, but I had fries. Fries were amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's touch up on the financial education. Previously before, this is your second time around. You had seen it before. More at that time when they were doing it, they wanted to structure more like a nine to five, but you found out it's not for you. Mm-hmm. Now, it's a little bit different. What made you want to want to get into financial education? My mom. Mm-hmm. My mom. Um, my mom was a nail tech um, for as long as I can remember, and she didn't want to do nails anymore. And she just remembered like, hey, you, you know, you remember when you were doing the financial services? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, do you think I could do that? And I was like, yeah. So, you know, she got her license and um, she started making money her first week. And, you know, she was like, I want to build an agency. Like, you know, a lot of people like, can you help me build it? Mm -hmm. And at first I was kind of like reluctant. I was like, I mean, I'll help you. But I mean, don't ask me to like show up to all the meetings. Don't (laughs) ask me to like be there nine to five, which I'm not, you know. Yeah. Um, But it's the structure and the leadership is a lot different this time around. So I I enjoy it a lot better. Yeah. What did you feel for you the first time and even the second time that you know it was important to be able to educate people in regards to finances, personal finances, uh, that maybe you didn't get taught or that you like that you want to keep telling people about it? The first time around, I was, I would say I was a little bit more distracted Mm because I just had so much going on. Like I was still in school, I was um, DJing and then I was more focused on having fun, you know? Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, I remember I would just like kind of show up to the meetings, like still drunk. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it sucked, man. But I mean, I showed up, but it's just like, like I said, like before it was the lack of leadership versus now. Um, now it's like, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit more responsible. You know, like I own my own home. You know, I, I, I take care of my dog. Like there's a dependent on me. Yeah. You know, I help my family with their bills and. So it's like I have a lot, a lot more weighing on me. So it's like I, you know, and just as in a, just being older, it's just like you, you understand, you know, we're more interested in like retirement investment, you know? Yeah. Um, When you're in your early 20s, you don't really think about that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you be surprised that <clears throat> a lot of the stuff not taught to us, not to mention a lot of the time you don't realize how fast time passes, it passes by. by so quick. Yeah. You don't think about it, and it's cool not to think about it mm-hmm. for a while, but then after a while, you start realizing you have to be, for me, for me, personally, I don't feel Social Security is going to be available for me. Mm-hmm. I have to be able to have something in place to be able to sustain me, in addition to the 401k, because I don't feel like Social Security is going to be around for me. Right. Would it be another supplement thing that maybe the government imp- implements? No. The way that the Social Security supposed to work is that people were dying sooner or sooner than expected and that's the reason why like for example people were living up to, to like 50 something and, and the retirement was like 60 something so it, it made sense that a lot of times they were going to cash out right mm-hmm. so there would have been a lot more money mm-hmm. but then all of a sudden what started happening it started getting better so now we're living longer and then more people are cashing in on social security number than they expected to so all the money's running out of Social Security. Right. Because people are still living longer. And then even though they keep stretching the age of 67, I think now it is. So whatever, you can retire at 65, but you can push it to 67. I think they're even going to push it, push it even longer because, I mean, even people there are 60-something, they still look very young and mobile and they look great. Right. So it, I just don't feel like it's going to be for me, at least. So I have to start for me, personally, start creating something else for me mm-hmm. to be able to help me out mm-hmm. at least i didn't think about it for a long time but it's important it i gets mean to that even point. after covid mm-hmm. i mean what did we even get we still had our bills to pay but what they gave us like four hundred dollars or something for, i forget how much it was in a, it was in a lot it wasn't a lot not like to mention, one time they gave it to us one time <laughs> not to mention it's the crazy thing is that even though it's 2024 there was a whole, almost a whole entire year that the government said you can stay home and you cannot leave your house. And literally everybody stayed at the house for the most part, right? Of course, you have your essential workers, but you never in this entire, in my entire existence, did I ever think that something like that could happen. And it happened. Yeah, but it's just like, even then it was just like it happened. But 
our bills still needed to be yep. paid, yep. which kind of opened my eyes because it was like our government and our union is not going to help us. No. Nope. You know, so I think that was also like a driving point for me um, as far as like financial literacy. And also like, you know, I see a couple of my friends, you know, um, they do bad investments. Like they, they talk, they think they know about certain investments. And then the next time you talk to them, they're like, oh man, I lost like almost all of my savings or whatever like that, you know? And I, you know what I liked about the financial education part is like, you have to build it up to be able to get mm -hmm. to that point, right? Because we all, everybody, a lot of us are always about the quick buck to try to flip it like your friends mm -hmm. and don't have everything else set up right. in place. Like, that's why I like the financial foundation part mm -hmm. that you have to do it in steps. It's not overnight mm -hmm. to be able to prepare you. Right. You're getting prepared as you're learning and setting it up for you to be able to do something mm -hmm. better for yourself in the future. Right. Instead of hoping and wishing that you can invest this 10,000 here, whatever, and hope it flips into something better because mm -hmm. you can only do it so long. Right. And not to mention it's never going to be always there. Mm -hmm. Like the passive income is not going to be there for you. Right. So right. that's pretty cool. All right. What else did you, have you impacted you as far as financial education for you personally that you learned more in addition to the things that you told me already? Um, Like the fact that, I mean, I, I see some of my friends, like some of them have like, you know, you think that they're doing well. Like, for instance, like I have this one friend. Mm -hmm. Um, She would always post like her, her boyfriend or whatever. And they're living like a really nice life, like extravagant. In social media yeah. or in real life? Well, social media. Yeah. So like, you you know, he has like a badass penthouse in like downtown L.A. or something like that. And they're going on extravagant trips and stuff like that. But he ends up passing away prematurely. Mm -hmm. And I saw GoFundMe, you know, so it's like. Uh, it's like stuff like that, you know. Yeah. And then I've had some friends that are late that were laid off, and they didn't have enough like emergency fund, and they were having to dip into like retirement plans. And they don't. Sometimes people don't understand that when you do that, you get penalized. Yeah. But they don't teach you these things, you know. So I think that's also important. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, we all want to live. Mm -hmm. We all want to live to the fullest and everything. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way sometimes right. for some of us. Unfortunately, some right. of our closest people, it's going to they're gonna, it's gonna be a thing of yeah. life that happens. Yeah. You have to prepare. I've I seen that too. And I think it's pretty sad that everything looks perfect on social media. Mm -hmm. They're all here and there. And then before you know it, the family is trying to scramble for it. Right. Where? There's things that you are able to set in place, preparation. Yeah, but a lot of people be, don't think about that. They don't. You know, and so. especially like a lot of my friends. And then, you know, I've had friends, they think that they're they're invincible and then boom, they get cancer. Yeah. You know? No, it's the deal. So it's, it's yeah, I think financial literacy is important because if you don't have that rainy day or you don't know how to, you know, plan correctly, you plan, you know, plan to fail almost. No, that is the saying, right? If mm -hmm. you don't plan, uh, if you don't plan, you plan to fail. Right, and yeah. And it will happen to mm -hmm. you. Like, so there's a lot of, the T knows regarding financial education to help you set up, uh, maybe not the conventional, typical uh, financial advisor that you might be able to go to talk to. However, there's other things that you can set your, yourself in place mm -hmm. to be able to be in a better position going forward. Whatever stage of life that you're at, you need to be able to know that it's, you have to come to that day to where you start setting yourself up for a, for the future. Mm -hmm. It's going to come eventually. Mm -hmm. You might be 20, but before you know, you'll be 30. Yeah. And you think it's, it's a great deal that you made a, the milestone of 30 years old. Mm -hmm. But if you have nothing else, you have not been building anything, guarantee you that day is going to come for yep. you. You'll be like, oh, my 401k ain't going to work. Oh, right. shit, I got laid off and I don't know what to do with this mm -hmm. money with 401k that I had. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people out there like T and myself to be able to help you out to help you prepare for the future yep so thank you all right we're running short on time so we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up but before i let you go any shout out i'm sorry any shout outs any shout outs that you have uh to anybody no, to the the original really. og crew no not really no <laughs> no you talk to any of them or, or still? not really no. none of them okay i i, I kind of segregated myself from that industry it's just very toxic too and then some of the people aren't like that great either you know, but it comes with time and the age part too, right? That eventually all those people that were friends at one time, you outgrew because you want more. Like, 
I know that you desire more and maybe their mentality is not the same mm-hmm. as you. So it happens to us. Mm-hmm. Well, how about your moms? Shout out to your moms. Yeah, definitely my mom. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What is it? What events you have coming up? Any events that you have coming up here in the near future and I, all your social media? Yeah, I do. But uh, they're all private parties. All private. Yeah, all private events. Yeah, can't make it. Yeah. Yeah, can't make it there. Sorry. All right. And all your social media. Where can they find you? TikTok, Instagram? Uh, mostly Instagram and TikTok, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they find you under? Mm-hmm. Under oh uh dj dot t rex t r e x x at okay. uh Instagram, and then I think my TikTok is like dj t h i r e x x r e x yeah okay great okay so tell me uh what is an important lesson that you learned during uh, doing DJing that you would tell your younger self that would help somebody else out what would that be? I mean. If it makes you happy, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. It's, it still trips me the heck out that you <laughs> had the guts to be able to like, oh, just, I just go DJ. I'll see my homies do it. Let, you yeah. know, just let me try it. Yeah. That's scary. Getting in front of people talking in the mic is scary. Uh, getting in front of people just talking in general is scary. Yeah, but, I actually don't MC. Yeah? Like, I, it's actually in my contract. Whenever they book me, I'm like, I don't MC. If you ever need an MC, holla. Sure. I'm one of the best party rockers there is. Or professional okay, okay bilingual mc i got you but my cool. my racer <coughs> higher now <laughs> gotta paint me okay so usually when i wake up or sometime during the day i remind myself i'm not immortal i am mortal and i will die one day and that's not to scare me i got it from this guru from india uh, but that's more of a realization that it is a real life right it's a real mm-hmm. thing it makes me want to do stuff and hurry up and do things uh because i know it's a part of life right with that i wish you long a long 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 pro- prosperous life before I hit the mic. Uh, I wish you a long prosperous life. But with that, what do you want people to think and feel about your life when everything's said and done? Uh, I don't know. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I've, I've actually just, like, I don't know, in my own little bubble, I don't really care what anyone thinks about me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That. Okay. And um, so, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I, I know you not that long ago, but I just knew you was dope from the moment i seen you by the way you dress but not to mention just looking into your story looking at the uh like knowing about your mom and knowing the journey mm-hmm. it takes to for making somebody from vietnam to here mm-hmm. and it's crazy it's crazy some of us from mexico and south america do have a journey to care but living in a communist place to be able to like sneak your way out and yeah. hopefully they would get killed on your way and just make it and then Go through the long process sometimes of getting sponsored and making it over here yep. all the way from the other side of the world. It's crazy to me. I, I enjoy this um, Exchanging Cultures episode because, you know, those those perspectives I, I don't see or I hear or sometimes I don't even aware of them until I actually get to talk to somebody like yourself or somebody else. Mm-hmm. They can tell me their journey. Not to mention just you in general about clearing some stuff up for me about how the Asian community might. I, I feel like I I know a little bit because I've seen TV mm-hmm. or things like that, mm-hmm. but it's not it's not true. Right. And the fact that like, fourteen years in the game DJing, you know, yeah, and just staying consistent with it and doing your thing, I think it's amazing. And without a doubt, DJ T Rex, you are an honorary Global Latin Factor. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. This was another episode of the Global Latin Factor podcast. Remember to subscribe. Don't play around. Don't play. We're already three years in. You got to subscribe right now if you type it in. And remember, we are just like you. We are humans. We are the spice in this melting pot that it is the world. Till next time. Pass. Pass. I'm still getting used to this new layout. Salute. Thank you so much for being part of the community, checking out this amazing story and this amazing episode. Make sure you go and subscribe to the channel and check out the episodes that we already have prepared for you. Thank you very much. Until next time. Coming to Havana and Rizzo, Puerto Rico. Yeah.